today I am here to talk about threshold signatures and accountable signatures and just a whole bunch of the signature work that I have been doing uh, with Peter Wola and Jonas Nick and Tim Ruffing and a few other people over the last year or so. So I'm going to start by going over what a Schnorr signature is. That's kind of been the buzzword for all of 2018 and probably all of 2019 as well. Um, and then talking about how Schnorr signatures generalize from multi-signatures to threshold signatures. Um, and then some cool tricks around threshold signatures. And I'm going to do it in a very algebraic fashion, okay? So I have almost all of my slides look something like this. And they're going to get increasingly complicated, but I'm going to pay decreasingly much attention to, to what's actually written there. Um, so, so this slide, I'm, I'm going to actually try to explain every line in some detail. And then as we get going, I'm going to start just sort of pointing vaguely and saying, oh, this means that, and don't worry about it. And, you won't have to worry about it. Nobody, nobody needs to worry about this stuff. The point is just the shapes and the colors, which I hope will communicate how much fun it is to work on this kind of stuff. So, this is a Schnorr signature. Uh, specifically, uh, a Schnorr signature consists of these two values, S and R, which are computed by the following, or the, the shown equations there. Um, the way this works is we start with a key pair. The way all these signatures work is you start with this key pair. You've got a secret key, which I've denoted x, and in my slides I'll try to keep all my secret values in, in red, okay? A secret key called x, and a public key called p. And the way you get from this secret key to the public key is you have some elliptic curve group generator. This is some object that you can add to itself in some formal sense of add that's not too important. Um, very many times. So x is some random number, we add g to itself that number of times, and then you get a public key. And it turns out that if I give you some curve point, and I say, oh, I got this by adding g to itself a whole bunch of times, you can't tell me how many times I added it. So this preserves the secrecy. So to produce a Schnorr signature, what we do is we create this sort of ephemeral key pair called a nonce. You can see the equation r here. I think of a new secret key k, which I'm going to use just for this signature. I'm going to do the key derivation to get this, this object r. And then I'm going to do something a bit, a bit funny. I'm going to hash up all of, all of this data. I'm going to hash up my public key. I'm going to hash up my nonce. And I'm going to hash up this extra auxiliary input called a message. And really, in a signature, the message is the most important part, right? So I'm going to throw all of this into a hash function, into SHA2 or something. And the result is what's called a challenge. I'm, I'm getting a random number out of the hash function. Um, and what I'm going to do with this random number is I'm going to produce a signature. I'm going to compute this equation here, this s equals k plus ex, this little linear equation, using this challenge and using my two secret keys. Okay? And to verify this equation, you do the following. This is a verification equation. So the last line here is a signing equation. The verification equation, so what everyone else is going to do, is the same except that just multiplied every single term of the signing equation by g. And we're going to see this over and over and over. I'm going to have increasingly complicated equations up there. And every time when I want something to be verifiable, I'm just going to stick g's in a bunch of places. OK? So you can see the signing equation has these two secret values. I don't want anyone to know them. I'm adding them together in this weighted sum um, to produce a single value s. So there's nothing being revealed about either of them. But when I multiply everything by g, the public knows s. They can multiply s times g. k times g is my public nonce x times g is my public key, and e the public knows. So you can sort of see that the components of the verification equation are all things that everybody can, can verify. So that means that I, um, the knower of x and g, can produce a signature, but everybody who knows my public key can verify. Okay? And that's the Schnorr signature. So I'm going to do a little bit of a diversion now from Schnorr signatures to talk about something called sign to contract. And so here is my Schnorr signature equation. But now I've added this extra step, where I said I was going to create a public nonce by thinking up this secret key k, this ephemeral secret key k. I'm going to do that, but now I'm going to take another message called c here, I guess, and I'm going to tweak my public nonce. I'm going to tweak both my public nonce and my secret nonce by a hash of my original public nonce and this extra message. And what this is doing, what the third line here, this r equals r naught plus, plus hash thing is doing, is it's turning um, this quantity r from just being 
like an ephemeral public key from being an elliptic curve point to also being a commitment to some auxiliary data C. And this is useful um, in a few different situations. One of them, notably, is for timestamping. This lets you turn a signature into a commitment. This lets you put that signature onto the blockchain. Um, and then because the signature itself is a commitment, you've now committed some data in the blockchain without any additional space being used. The kind of the cool feature of this R equals R naught plus whatever equation is that the um, resulting point is just a point. This is a, the, the resulting signature here is S and R, and this E, which everyone can compute. It's exactly the same as a signature without a commitment. Okay? Um, so that's useful. It's useful for time stamping. It's useful for another thing, which I will get to at the end of my talk. And it's useful for kind of a, uh, a weird application, which I'm going to try to describe here. Oh, first, here's my verification equation. See, it hasn't changed. Just multiply everything by G. Okay. Um, all right. But, see, before I go to that, let me say, suppose that you have a hardware wallet that is producing these. Okay, that's producing your signatures. Normally, you give your hardware wallet a message. It knows a secret key. Um, it will produce these, these secret nonces. It's going to compute this value k, the secret value k, ephemerally. And there's a couple important properties that k needs to have if it's going to work as an ephemeral secret key. And all of those properties can be summarized by saying that k needs to be uniformly random. And if k is deviates from uniform at all, if there's even a little bit of bias, if it's like, if the highest order bit is zero, like 1% more often than is one, that's a problem. If you produce enough signatures and you publish enough of those, um, then somebody can take even that small amount of bias and eventually uh, exploit that to actually solve for all of the different Ks and your secret key, and then you lose all your coins. So it's really important that K be uniformly random. And the way that this is done, typically, is in a hardware wallet, what you do is you take your message and you take your uh, secret key or some other secret data that you've got on the hardware wallet and you just hash all of that up to produce K. And the output of a hash, we believe, is a random function. Um, that's sort of an assumption that we use throughout Bitcoin and throughout a lot of cryptography. And that gives us a way to uniformly produce a value K, assuming that our hash function is secure. And we get a random number, but we don't need a random number generator. Those are difficult to implement in hardware. They're impossible to verify. Um, they, uh, it's not nice to require a random number generator, basically. And this also is nice because it's stateless. So there are some other ways to generate random numbers where you require your hardware wallet to make sure that it's not reusing the same random seed, it's in incrementing something or doing something like that. If all you're doing is hashing up your message and your secret, then you get this stateless, random number generator that does not require any hardware random number generation, which is great. But this interacts kind of badly with signing the contract if you try to do it naively. And so let me show you guys this equation. And now here's, here's the part where I'm going to stop pointing out all the individual features. All I'm going to say is suppose that you have your hardware wallet here. And up top here I'm saying it's producing this value k by hashing up the secret in the message, like, like a good hardware wallet should be doing. Um, and you ask it to do a signed a contract with this value C, this commitment C. So it produces this value K the way that it should, it hashes up the secret of the message, and then tweaks K by adding this extra hash, um, and, then, uh, and then it produces a signature. That's great. So suppose you go to the hardware wallet and ask it to re-sign the same message. So I'm not going to change M here, the same message, and I ask it to commit to a different value, C prime. So the hardware wallet will produce two signatures, which we see here, these two S equations. And because I've tweaked the commitment, I've managed to change the public nonce, I've changed the signature in a way that the hash challenge is going to change. But the difference between these two equations, um, or I should say, these two equations both use K, the same K, the same, the same secret nonce K. Um, so the difference between these two equations does not have K anymore. So you can see by counting the number of red entities, and I realize I'm using burgundy as well as red, and I apologize for that. Um, the last equation there is one equation, it only has one red entry. You can see if you just shuffle everything except for the red X onto the left-hand side of that, you can solve for X. So this is a problem. If you have a hardware wallet that supports signing the contract, and you ask it to sign the same message twice with different commitments, I guess you would be able to extract the secret key this way. 
There's a simple fix to this, of course. Um, there's always a simple fix. That's going to be kind of the lesson of this talk. I'm going to bring up time and time again. You know, you do this and then lol, like the secret key's lost. But there's always a simple fix, okay? There's always a simple fix. And uh, the simple fix in this case is that um, when the hardware wallet's generating its nonce, it should not only hash the secret key and the message, it should also hash the commitment. So you give it this commitment, and now it takes that commitment, and now it can use that to make sure it generates a unique nonce, even if you change the commitment on it. So now if you change the message or the commitment, it will use a different K value. If you try to do the subtraction, you will have different Ks in the two signature equations, and they aren't going to cancel out like this. So, now let me talk about kind of a cool application of signing a contract, and why it too does not quite work, but there's a simple fix. <laughs> so, um, something, that, uh, the technique I want to talk about, which I believe originates with Greg Maxwell, is to use sign a contract as a way to prevent nonce side channel attacks. So I mentioned that if these nonces K are biased in any way, shape, or form, um, well, if they're biased in the sense that the bits have, the individual bits have detectable uh, deviations from uniform, then it's Paul, then you'll leak your secret key. And it's a bit more insidious than this, actually. A hardware wallet could do something like producing random nonces and then H-macking that nonce with some secret key that only some attacker knows and thereby introduce a bias in individual bits that's only detectable by somebody who knows this HMAC key. So it's possible to produce signatures that appear uniformly random that are resilient to whatever weird attack super analysis you want to put on it, um, but which nonetheless are slightly biased in ways that only some bad guy can tell. And if you have a piece of hardware generating such signatures, then there's not really any way to verify that this isn't happening. This is a risk right now for, for every single hardware wallet that is currently in use, that the random numbers that it is generating might not be being generated perfectly honestly. Um, and the gen in general, the way to detect this um, is to create some dummy signatures with a secret key that you extract from the hardware wallet and then you can solve for K and then check that it was produced deterministically or something like that. Um, but that's very difficult to do and you can't do it with signatures that you actually want to use. If you've got keys that you're actually using on the blockchain, you don't want to be pulling those secret keys out of your hardware wallet and then doing a bunch of analysis and plugging them into Sage and stuff. That's just, that's not prudent. So, instead there's a way where if you trust your host computer, you can ask the host computer to insert some additional randomness into your nonce so that even if your hardware wallet is somehow compromised and even if it's trying to produce nonces that have this detectable bias, we can totally clear out that bias just using the, uh, the sign to contract equation. So it's up there in the middle there, it says K plus hash, whatever there. The trick here is that even if K is biased, that hash is not biased. So you have something of, of questionable uniformity added to something that is unquestionably uniform, um, and you're great. So, no, you don't even need, you just need C to be unique, I think. Okay, yes. Yep. Or you need, to, you need to be mutually independent. Yes, okay. There are some specific things I can say here. But all I'm going to say is that I need C to be unique. Okay? So your host generates some value C. Uh, it needs to have high enough entropy. It needs to be something that somebody can't guess, I guess. Um, so you give the hardware wallet something to commit to, some C. And this even could be something that you want to commit to in the blockchain, but you maybe put it in a Merkle tree with some other uniformly random data or something. The point is, you are going to require the hardware wallet to produce a commitment to something uniformly random. Um, or something sufficiently random. And then you aren't going to publish what that commitment is. Unlike the timestamping application or some of the other applications I'm going to talk about, we aren't going to publish what C is. Or at least we're not going to publish everything about C. Um, and we just throw that away. And so the resulting nonce will have no trace of C being in there. Nobody can tell that this was done. But as long as your host was acting honestly, the resulting nonce will be useless to anybody trying to attack this. Basically, the security comes down to either K is working correctly, which we can hope is all happening today, um, or, or your host is okay and it's able to reliably produce some randomness with enough entropy. But, again, this is kind of subtle, and if you do it in the naive way, it sort of doesn't work, right? You give some uniformly random thing to your hardware wallet, right? It does this K equals hash of XMC here. It's great, it produces a unique nonce. Well, no, well, if you give it C in advance, then it can just try, 
Rather than using a hash function, it can just like keep trying a bunch of k's until it finds one such that k plus this hash here still has a detectable bias. And if it's trying to produce like one bit of bias, then it only has to try twice on average, right? So, uh, so that's no good. So you don't want to tell the hardware wallet C what it's committing to until it's already decided what its original nonce is going to be. Because the idea is we, we don't trust the original nonce, we want to make the hardware wallet commit to that, and then we want to like re-randomize it. And so the way we do this is that we instead, instead of sending the hardware wallet C to begin with, we send it a commitment to C, a commitment to the randomness we want it to commit to. The hardware wallet will reply with is untweaked nonce. Then we say, okay, now I'm going to give you the actual data that I want you to commit to. And the hardware wallet will go and, and do everything the way that you expect it to. It will output a signature. Um, and because you gave it a commitment to C, it's able to ensure that if you like, tweak C in some way, that it's not susceptible to replay attacks. But because it doesn't know C itself, it is unable to predict what the nonce it will eventually produce is, and will be unable to insert any bias into that. Okay, so this, is, this winds up being a sort of implicit in this slide, but you wind up having like this three-step protocol with a hardware wallet, uh, which then allows you to eliminate any possibility of a nonce side channel, um, a, a biased a side channel using a biased nonce. I, uh, I asked some of my, my friends earlier if I could find like a sexier name for this anti-nonce side channel, and then they got sidetracked saying, well, what if the N stood for naughty, ha ha, and then we didn't, we didn't get a name out of it. So. Anti-nonce side channel measure, ANSM. Okay, so I'm going to move on from signed to, from signed to contract for a little while, and now I'm going to talk about Schnorr multi-signatures. So we recall the Schnorr equation from uh, the first slide. It is the first and last, it, it's, it's in there. I've interspersed it with a whole bunch of other equations now. And what I'm going to do here um, or what I've done here to change the Schnorr verification equation is now I've introduced a whole bunch of parties. Um, I guess I haven't said how many. Let's say there's n of them. Okay? We've got n parties. Each of them have their own secret key. And they're going to produce a joint key now by just adding together all of their secret keys and adding together all of their public keys. Um, and because of the linearity of my private public mapping function, I can just add secrets together, and then I can add the corresponding public things together, and it will all, all the algebra will just work out. This is all correct. And so this is actually a way to produce a Schnorr multi-signature. The steps are, first off, during key setup time, everybody throws some secret keys. Sorry. Everybody produces a secret key. Everybody throws their public keys at each other. We add them up. That's the second equation here. P is the sum of everyone's individual public keys. Then during signing time, everybody produces a nonce, an ephemeral public key, as though they're going to produce a signature. Except instead of using that directly, they throw that in a pot and everyone adds this up. So that's kind of in the middle of the slide here. We have this R as a sum of everybody's contributions to R. And then, uh, and then we're good. We've got a public key, we've got a public nonce, we've got a message, we can compute this challenge E. So once everybody throws their nonce in the pot, everybody can compute E. And then they all produce a signature, same as they would have. You can see this SI equals KI plus E times XI. You can see some funny spacing here that I'm, I'm going to get to in a sec. Um, and then you can add all the signatures together. So to get the final public key, everyone added their public keys. To get the final nonce, everyone added their nonces together. To get the final like, scalar, scalar part of the signature, uh, everyone adds their scalar parts of the signature together. It's great. And we can see our verification equation, as always, just involves adding a whole bunch of Gs to that. And we can see our partial signatures are the second to last line here. Um, these can be verified by everyone while they're signing. So if the final signature doesn't verify, it's possible to look at the individual partial signatures and see, oh, which party was misbehaving, um, and, uh, and identify that person, and I guess check them out or restart or something. I mean, if you've already started the multi-signature protocol, then, uh, I mean, it, it depends what your protocol is, what you do about cheaters, but it's certainly detectable which one, no matter how many parties you have. But there's a problem here. Um, which is in the first two lines here, where I generated the public key, there is kind of a serious problem here, which is that if some party knows everybody else's public keys, and they choose their public key to cancel out everyone else's public keys, you can see that this second line here, where you just add up every, add everything together, 
if somebody kind of poisoned the well there, they can produce a final public key that's entirely controlled by them. So you can see like the sum of all these secret keys should be um, should have contributions from every single signer, but if somebody maliciously cancels out all of everyone else's contributions and they just have their own contribution, the result is something that looks like a multi-signature key, but actually it's just one party can produce signatures. So that's no good. There's a simple solution, and here the word simple is false in two senses. One is that it's not actually that simple of an equation, and the other is that it took us over a year to get this, and two failed papers, one of which was rejected in peer review. The other got through peer review, and then someone else wrote a paper proving that our paper couldn't be correct because it was impossible to write that paper, which is really like quite a strong mathematical result. I don't know how many of y'all are academics and have published papers, um, but uh, if you've gotten through peer review and then found somebody produced an impossibility result, not of your result, but of the proof that you made, the claim was that it was impossible for our proof to be correct. Anyway, um, we, fi we fixed it, it's fine. It's a simple fix, it's always a simple fix, okay? Well, the, oh, it was, that's right, I got the email today. It finally, it gave it through peer review again, and it's, it's published today, that's right. Um, cool, so let me start with a simple fix and then, then the simple fix to, to the simple fix. So the first simple fix is that we are going to hash up Yes, this is a, this, okay. It's the first part of the simple fix that we're actually going to deploy. Okay, that, that's, that's okay. relevant. That's not a detour. Thank you, Greg. Um, so we're going to hash up everybody's public keys here. You can sort of see in the middle of that first line there's a hash of public key one, public key two, public key three, and so on. And we're going to get this thing that is re-randomized whenever anybody changes their public keys. And then every individual signer is going to produce this object called a music coefficient, this mu i. And what that is, is they take the, uh, the hash of everyone's public keys, they hash that up alongside their index in, in the signing protocol. And what this means is that if anybody tries to change their public key in response to the other people's choice of public keys, in an attempt to like cancel them out or something, what will happen is that this giant hash of everyone's public keys will change, and then everybody's music coefficient is going to change. And then in our sum, which is now line uh, I guess it's line two here, um, lines two and three, our sum now has a random uh, scaling factor on everybody's public keys. And whenever anyone tweaks their public key, everybody's scaling factor changes, and there's just no way to, to cancel that out. And, uh, and you can prove this uh, in the sense of provable security, and there's a paper that we published today, um, or that was published today, that, uh, that goes through all of the gory details. It's, it's very involved, but intuitively, intuitively that's the thing, right? If you change your key, you mess up everybody's randomizers, and uh, whatever equation you were hoping to achieve there, you've, you've destroyed, because you re-randomized everything. And so we go through, and we just run through exactly the same equations as I just described. You add up all your nonces, you add up all your signatures, everything's golden, you publish a signature, and it's all great. The only difference is, unfortunately, this offset a bit, so you can't quite see, I've added mu i twice here. I should have added it three times, there's still a gap there. Um, I've just added these mu i's in all of these sums. Okay? Great. So, I'm going to do an even further diversion now into something called verifiable secret sharing. Um, and here's where like, I really don't expect y'all to be following the algebra exactly. Even, even if you're okay up to the last slide, this one I think has quadratic number of secret values that I'm just gonna throw into a matrix, like an implicit matrix, like you can imagine repeating this line a lot of times. Um, so, suppose, suppose that somebody wants to shard their secret key. One of the participants in this giant multi-signature wants to give the other participants um, some objects that will allow the other people to reconstruct their secret key. And as you guys will see, they're not, nobody's ever going to reconstruct secret keys. They're actually going to just produce signatures. But suppose that you've got, say, like 10, 10 parties who all want to produce a signature, and somebody maybe doesn't want to participate necessarily, so they want to give the other nine parties enough data that those nine parties together can reproduce their secret, okay? The way they do it is with something called um, Shamir secret sharing, where they basically choose this giant random polynomial, and that's what this first line is, this PI 
of x, this random formal polynomial. So they choose a whole bunch of these coefficients, all these gamma iks are, are uniformly random things. They choose this polynomial of order k minus 1, where k is the number of people they want to split their secret to. So if they want nine participants to be able to reconstruct it, they have to use degree 8. And then they evaluate this polynomial at some small integers, at 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, and they give each of these evaluations to individual people. And that's sort of the middle of the slide here. We've got the zeta ij is the, um, the evaluation at j of participant i's secret polynomial. And if you can imagine this middle equation being written over and over and over, you'll see like a matrix of all of these random values. And you can imagine inverting that matrix and solving for the uh, secret xi from all of these different equations. And I'm just hand waving through this, but it's certainly it's a possible thing to do. And this is called the Grange interpolation, and what you get is this final equation at the bottom here. So it turns out, given any subset of k parties, so let's be a bit more interesting, rather than 9 of 10, imagine you've got like 5 of 10. So now you've got like 10 choose 5 different possible subsets. If once you choose a subset of 5 participants, you can compute these Lagrange coefficients. And then there's a sum, these Lagrange coefficients, lambda ij's, you multiply those by the secret zeta ij's, and you sum those all up, and you will reconstruct the original secret key. Okay? And so now you'll see all of my sums from here on are going to specify where I'm summing over the, the people who are signing, which is going to be a subset of the total participants, or whether I'm summing over everybody. And I'll, I'll do that for, I think, two slides till I got lazy. So, that's Shamir's secret sharing. Verifiable secret sharing is this. So I'm just going to throw some G's on here. Um, and so one issue with using Shamir secret sharing for threshold signatures, which is what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides, is that if one party gives shards to all the other participants, and they do so in an inconsistent way, such that it's not actually possible to reproduce their public key, this can be very difficult to detect. You need like extra rounds of interaction, and, and um, if you're combining, if multiple people are doing the sharding at once, which they will, and you're combining things, you wind up either needing to use a whole bunch of memory and a whole bunch of extra communication, or you find you're unable to tell who's misbehaving. So a goal in these kind of schemes is that we want a way for people to shard their works is that they take all of their secret coefficients from their secret polynomial, these gamma ij's, they multiply those by g to get a whole bunch of public coefficients and they publish those. They publish those to all of the other participants using some sort of broadcast channel or message board or IRC channel or signal group. Blocked, ah, they should not use a blockchain, please. Um, <laughs> they could, it would work. There would be no consequences for them, but don't do it. So, however they do it, they publish their, their public coefficients. Um, they all see that, and then they can verify. Uh, everybody who receives one of these uh, zeta ij's can just run this equation here. They can see, they multiply their zeta ij by g, and then they, uh, you see the left-hand side there, or the, the leftmost term is the participant's public key, and they have all these public coefficients. They add it up, they multiply it by their index, index squared, index cubed, so on, and they get an equation, which, uh, which hopefully should be true if uh, the issuing party is being honest. Okay, so that's verifiable secret sharing. So using verifiable secret sharing, it is possible to do a multi-signature, and it's actually kind of cool. So what this slide is showing is that if we start from a, uh, a joint public key, that's owned by all these participants, and here's just the, the top line of this equation, or the, the, the first equation on this slide is just my original music equation, right? I have a whole bunch of parties, they all contribute some secret key, they all, um, they, they add up all of their contributions to the key and they get a final key. What the bottommost equation here is saying that rather than summing up contributions from everybody, I can take just a subset of signers which might be much smaller, maybe like five signers out of the, the 10 parties. And just those set of signers now is somehow able to sum up, um, sum up their contribution. And here now I've got this red box object. And it's, it's actually this, 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 um, this sum thing in the second to last line, but I'm just gonna call it the box object from now on. Everyone who's signing has this box object. And it kind of depends on the secret that they were issued during key setup. So implicitly here, every party does this 
um, verifiable secret share. They all give shares to every other party, and then using all the shares that everyone's like communicated around, there's quadratically many shares floating around here. Um, these equations work out, and now a subset of the original set of signers is able to sign. And what's cool about this is that it looks like after you multiply by these Lagrange efficients, Lagrange coefficients, and you produce these red box objects, what it looks like is just my original multi-signature equation, okay? And we can see this in this slide here. So this is my Schnorr multi-signature slide from, uh, from a little while ago, except everywhere that I had somebody's secret key, I've now replaced it with this red box object. So the way that threshold signatures uh, extend multi-signatures is these two extra steps. First off, at key setup, everybody has to do the sharding, you get all these shards passing around. And secondly, when they start a signing session, everybody who is participating in the signature, which now, remember, is a subset of the total set of possible signers, everybody participating computes these red box objects. And they do that. It's a very straightforward way to compute that. It's just this, this sum that looks complicated on a slide, but you can see it. You're literally just doing a couple multiplications and adding, adding up the contributions from everybody. Um, and you can do this. It doesn't take um, a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of memory. It's very straightforward. And uh, once again, we can throw our Gs here. Um, if you want to verify these things, you can verify the partial signatures. You can verify the final signature. But what's cool here is that I already showed you guys this. So the extension to threshold signatures is actually, conceptually, once you're past the key setup, threshold signatures aren't different from multi-signatures in terms of implementation complexity or in terms of... Um, how you think about security of the multi-signing protocol. Okay, and that's, uh, that's something I might go into afterwards if I feel like I still want to talk. Um, but the, the signing protocol here, I've been, I've been waving my hands a little bit about how everybody throw their nonces into the pot and then how they, they compute this challenge, and uh, that's actually a whole other set of irritating things that leak keys, but which have simple solutions. Um, that took us quite a while to get through. Um, but rather than saying more about that, I am just going to move on and talk about accountability. Okay? So, in the last slide I mentioned this kind of cool feature that once you decide who is producing the signature, you throw these Lagrange coefficients in, everybody creates their red box objects, it's great. Well, the thing is that after you add up all the red box objects, you get the original public key. And when you use these red box objects to produce these partial signatures and you add those all up, you just get a signature with the total public key. And the thing is that the sum doesn't actually depend on the specific set that was used. These red box objects depend on your set of signers, but they somehow go away. That they all conspire to add up to the same thing, no matter how they were computed. And the result is that the signature has no trace of the original set of signers in it. And in fact, there's no way to, to um, like tweak this such that the signature is going to have a trace of which sign is. So given a signature produced by some total public key, even if you know what all the red box objects would have been, even if you know all the signers participating and how many of them are required, you can't distinguish one that was created with one subset from one that was created with a different subset. Okay, this is something called accountability, the ability to do this. And somewhere where you might want accountability is say if you've got like, um, say a two of three, um, you've got some, some Bitcoins held by a two of three multi -signing pro um, threshold signing pro policy. And one of your three keys is like a cold wallet key or something. It would be nice if there was some evidence after the fact that that cold wallet key was used. Because you don't want people hauling that out of storage. I see some BitGo employees nodding at me. Um, you, don't, you, you want some evidence of this key being used, right? And with these unaccountable threshold signatures, you don't get that. You can't distinguish between a signature that was created using the hotkeys, honestly, using whatever your, your correct signing protocol is, and one that was created in an illegitimate way. So, if this is an unaccountable multi-signature, or an unaccountable threshold signature, sorry, um, what would an accountable threshold signature look like? Well, I mean, we have one in Bitcoin, right? It's possible to create a threshold signature uh, by taking a bunch of individual signatures and just concatenating them, and it turns out that's a special signature, right? If you want to require that any five of 10 people, um, of a fixed set of 10 people, sign some message, you can just ask five of them to sign the message separately, 
and just take all of their signatures in a row, and there you go. You can just validate each one, one after the other. And, uh, and if you're Satoshi, maybe you just also validate them against different public keys, just kind of all over the place. Because validation is cheap, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that's one way to get it. But the thing is that uh, ignoring all the goofiness around the check multisig off code, which an eerily high number of you guys got there, um, this is large. Like, if you want to do a 5 of 10 signature, it's five times as large as a single signature because you've literally got five signatures there, right? And it's possible to do better than having the linear growth in your threshold signature size, like every time you add a sign or you add an entire another signature, by doing stuff like combining keys in various ways and putting it into Merkle trees and stuff, and you can get like a polylog sized threshold signature. But this constant size business, so what, what the uh, really cool thing about these Schnorr multi-signatures that I've been describing so far is that they're constant size. The resulting signatures look the same as a single signature, it seems like you can't get an accountable signature that has this. And there's kind of um, like vague, intuitive um, information theoretical reasons you might think that should be impossible, right? Because as you increase your threshold size, if you're doing like 500 of 1,000 signers, there's 1,000 choose 500 different possibilities there. You get this combinatorial explosion in how, much, how many different admissible signing sets there are and if you've got a constant size signature coming out of there, it's not clear how you could fit like combinatorially much information into that, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, so just an intuition, because like already by having constant size multi-signatures, it sort of seems like we're violating similarly, uh, you know, unviolable uh, information theoretical bounds. But but it does really seem like we can't get a constant size accountable signature. Which, uh, which sucks. You've got to choose between constant size, which is awesome for efficiency and also awesome for privacy because it hides your total signing set and your threshold policy and all that good stuff. You have to choose between that and accountability. So in my next slide, I'm going to describe kind of a compromise. So this is a compromise. This is what a compromise looks like in mathematics um, between accountability and unaccountability. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back that signed contract construction that I was talking about way at the beginning and then pretended to forget about. I'm going to now do a sign to contract in a multi-signature. And what's exciting about this, actually, is that all of your signers can check that the final signature is doing a sign to contract and what data is, uh, is committing to before they produce their partial signature. So the second to last line here, as always, is their partial signature. You notice this is computed by every signer after they know E. E here is a hash of all of this data. E in particular is a hash of the public nonce R. So if anybody doesn't like what's being committed to, they will well, see what's committed to because otherwise they can't compute R and they will just refuse to reduce their partial signature and they will refuse to participate in the signature. So this multi-signing business gives you kind of this cool ability where you can say, not only does a signature commit to something, but it's committing to something in a way that every person who contributed to the signature, agreed to. And actually, you can, you can formalize this. You can prove that if you extend a Schnorr signature by adding this auxiliary signed to contract data, that's the commitment C and the R naught, then, uh, then you actually get a strong signature on the auxiliary data. So a Schnorr signature with extra stuff with a signature on the actual message you're signing, it's also a signature on the committed data, which is a cool feature that I'm going to exploit here um, again, verify. Um, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my unaccountable constant size threshold signature and I'm going to, in parallel to producing this, I'm going to produce an accountable signature. I'm just going to have everybody individually sign the data. And, um, and then I'm going to take that accountable signature, the giant accountable signature that's growing with a set of, of signers, and I'm just going to commit that inside my unaccountable signature. And because, as I mentioned, um, the individual signers can enforce that this data is there. If you have an HSM or something that you're willing to trust to enforce some business logic, and this is a very simple piece of extra signing logic, then you can get this accountability, um, assuming that your hardware is not uh, completely borked. And, uh, and then assuming that at least one party in this multi-signature is being honest and is willing to reveal the commitment to an auditor or, or to the public or somewhere, um, 
then you get basically an accountable signature. And it's like a hardware enforced accountable, unaccountable signature. There's another thing I need a name for. And that's not that. Forget what I said. I guess <laughs> I forget it's on, it's on camera now, but hopefully I stuttered enough that no one knows where the words started and ended. Now, um, this doesn't help. So one reason that you might want accountability is if you're worried that like nobody producing the signature is honest. You're worried somebody had actually like stolen your keys and run away with them and is producing signatures. And this is not going to help with that because then they can just not do the commitment if they've actually stolen the keys. But, um, but if your keys are on hardware tokens that will enforce this extra accountability side channel thing um, and that extra accountability requirement is upheld, which is seem, that seems perfectly reasonable for a hardware token to be able to uphold that, uh, at least against a non-nation state attacker, then there's certainly a benefit here um, and it will uh, satisfy whatever auditability requirements you might have that make you want to have accountable signatures. So, in, uh, in closing, I know you guys are all, um, there are some delays, you guys are all up late, so I'm not going to go back and, and talk about all of the uh, extra fun problems we had with multi signatures. Let me just close with a bunch of open problems I have related to this, because this construction, I think, is kind of neat. It's not something that I've heard about before. I mean, it's got kind of a weird security model that nobody in academia should care about. Um, but, uh, but it's still useful in practice. And so there are a couple issues with it though. One is that suppose that this commitment is upheld and two people, so say you've got a two or three multi-signature or something, and two people who shouldn't be producing a signature go ahead and produce this signature. And they've got the audit log set that proves that they produced that signature. But the third person, who's maybe like the jilted party in some escrow arrangement, um, has no way of seeing what that commitment is, the third party can't produce the accountable signature, it can't produce a commitment. And what's kind of worse um, is that the, uh, the third party here can't even prove that they weren't involved. So it would be cool, it would be cool for one thing, if it was possible for somebody not involved with a signature to reproduce a commitment and actually figure out which two of the three parties were involved. That seems impossible, that sounds like, I mean it literally would be a constant size accountable multi-signature if that were possible. But there's a second thing which seems less impossible, which is can you just get deniability? Can one of the people who has some secret key material, who in principle could have been involved as a signature, somehow prove that none of their data went into the commitment? And then a the third open problem that, uh, that people like to talk about outside of Bitcoin, but within the cryptocurrency space, is what happens if we bring in these BLS signatures, these pairing-based signatures? These are kind of neat objects. Um, BLS signatures let you do non-interactive multi-signatures. There's like unaccountability on steroids, where like you produce a, a contribution to a multi-signature, and like other people can take that contribution and just add their signature, and you don't even have to know who they were or that they were involved or anything like that. And the result is just this constant size signature that hits the blockchain, and I guess you were involved with. I mean, your public key is part of the aggregate. Um, but there's no way to prove that, or there's no way to control that. And kind of a neat open problem, open question, is is there any way to add a form of accountability in this kind of way to BLS? Um, and I don't know, um, it's not the kind of problem that I worry about. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about pairings these days. Um, but a lot of people in this space do, and they might find that interesting. And then I have a fourth open problem that occurred to me while I was talking. Um, so, I mentioned that an accountable, one example of an accountable multi-signature, or an accountable threshold signature, is if you just concatenate individual signatures, right? So here's the fun question. Instead of using the, instead of creating like a separate signature during the threshold signing, what if we just use these partial signatures on the second to last line? Do you think those count as signatures for the purpose of being accountable? Like if you just committed to all of those SJs, that'd do it. Yeah, people are saying yes. Cool. <laughs> I believe I believe that's uh, how. Uh, that's how. That's how science works. Yes, this is how science works, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, if, that's if, what we call a proof. Yes, that is a proof. Look at that. Social proof. Yeah, excellent. So we have a social proof that actually you don't even need to do a separate signature. You just signed a contract to all of the partial signatures. Um, oh, there's a circularity here. You guys. <laughs> so, so the issue for, for those who aren't uh, playing along with me. Yeah, you just save the original month and re re redo it again, right? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. 
Okay, so. Just let you reuse the cash. Those won't be attached the issue. So, pardon, Oleg? Those won't be attached Yeah, okay, that, I, I see. There, there, there is a simple fix here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the issue. <laughs> The issue um, is that um, that these partial signatures are using this hash e, which itself depends on the commitment. And then if I if I want to commit to the partial signatures, then I'm I'm kind of stuck because I can't produce a partial signature without having already committed. But uh, but there are like multiple simple fixes that I heard from the audience there, so uh, so it's solvable. Um, cool. I think that's all that I want to say. Um, I'm happy to take questions for a while. And uh, thank you all. <laughs> okay. Well, hi. So, does anybody have questions? And while you think about those questions, I wanted to announce something else. You might have seen it already, but Chaincode Labs just announced their summer residency for this summer of 2019. Yes, and looking what to do in the summer, you really should apply. And then we'll be taking questions now. Wow. I'm hurt. Well, <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, so you talked about deniability, and uh, is there a way even to force the other two parties to make the commitment if you're not involved? No. So, uh, no. The other two parties, they have the ability to produce signatures that commits to anything at all or nothing at all. Um, and there is no way that there's no way to prevent that. There's no way to like tweak the keys or tweak the signature verification algorithm or, or something like that that would actually enforce that while still having this threshold policy property. Thank you, Theo. I, I also have a question for, uh, on uh, deniability. So, so you were saying maybe it's possible because none, none of the non-signer information leaked into the into public key. Theoretically, it, some of it leaked through the Lagrange multipliers, right? And, oh. and did I follow your talk correctly? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the question is, um, do these Lagrange multipliers... Oh, I see, yeah, I see what you're saying. Y so. You're saying I should be able to, to deny that I was part of signing. Yep. Actually, I was part of signing because I gave up uh, the Lagrange multipliers. Yep, so the issue is that no matter what set of Lagrange multipliers were used, you will still get all these same final equations. So like the, the signature would be produced even if you were lying about the Lagrange multipliers is a problem. Yeah, so you could like say, oh yeah, I was part of this, and then here are the Lagrange multipliers for if I was part of it, and they still work, they still add up, but you weren't part of it. It's just that all of them, all, all sets of Lagrange multipliers will work equally. about the commitments to the polynomial uh, terms. Yeah, the, yeah, the gammas, yeah. Remember there was a paper by Gennaro that was sort of like a follow-up to the Feldman verifiable shimmer, uh, secret sharing? Yep. Where they used Peterson commitments with extra binding factors to all of these terms, uh, trying to uh, like solve some security problem with the, with the original, like with the, with the initial key setup. Yeah, I remember that. Peter, do you remember what that was about? I, I think it's a cancellation problem. It's the same problem. So I think that that's a rogue key attack that you can have a verifiable secret sharing, and I don't think that it arises in the construction you're describing because of the using you know, on top of music authenticated keys. But that's a good question to check. Yeah, that's right. And actually, yeah, so we, we believe that because our original key was produced using music, there is no way to do key cancellation even within the sharding procedure. But that, that's a pretty non-trivial claim that right. we haven't worked through. It would be better to use a threshold secret sharing scheme that was inherently protected against that. Yeah. So this, is, this is the original Peterson 1990 verifiable secret sharing here. That's yeah, not yeah, even the they did one. Idea. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, um, oh, cool. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about the paper that you published in May of 2018. Um, so I was looking at figure three 
and uh, <laughs> can you remind me the paper and the figure? I'm, I'm sorry. Is this the music paper? Yeah, this is the music paper. Oh no. Was <laughs> oh, the figure complicated? Uh, no, so it was the music paper, and figure three is the size of the Bitcoin blockchain with oh. and without multi signatures. So comparing what it would be yep. like in 2018 if they had implemented music from the beginning. Yep. And I think the comparison was today it stands at 130 gigabytes. And if we had implemented it, it would have been 90 today. Um, but you also mentioned on storage savings that if we had also implemented key aggregation, um, that would be more storage savings. Um, could you, I guess, talk a bit more about that? So, so there are two things here. There's key aggregation and there's signature aggregation. Yeah. And so key aggregation is actually what I'm talking about here. This is where you get the constant size multi-signatures. The other thing, signature aggregation, I think is what you're referring to, yeah. where it would be possible to, um, to aggregate, I'll hand off to you, Peter, in a sec. Um, it's possible to aggregate signatures themselves after they've already been uh, added to a transaction. Mm -hmm. And then you can get some further savings that way. But signature aggregation has some complicated interactions with a whole bunch of other parts of the protocol, in particular, how soft forks are implemented, and also some stuff to do with blind signatures and so forth. So that is not, um, so signature aggregation probably is quite a ways away relative to key aggregation, where we just have a, a couple minor engineering things to work out. So Great, thank you. That's all correct what you're saying, but to answer your question, if I recall correctly, is that that figure actually only accounts for um, cross-input signature aggregation and not for key aggregation. Yeah, because we, we can't actually predict how people would have... The, so, so the issue here is that there's two disadvantages of the key aggregate approach that Andrew's talking about that are relevant here. One is that you lose accountability. And so even if Bitcoin had key aggregation from the start, just the loss of accountability might mean that not everyone would use it. The other limitation is that it requires at least one extra round of interaction while signing, which is kind of inconvenient if you're using like a hardware wallet stored in a safe. And so even with the ability to use key aggregation-based multi-signature or threshold signatures, some users may not use it. And so it's difficult for us to estimate what the actual usage of those things would be. Uh, that's also correct, but also not an answer to the question, because that same argument equally makes cross-input aggregation harder. Mm -hmm. um, the reason is just that figure was produced by um, counting the number of signature in every transaction and reducing it to one. But it does, it, it is very hard to count how many public keys are involved because those are in scripts that are committed to by the outputs. Plus, what you would see in practice if um, uh, multi-signatures were involved is you wouldn't use multi-signatures anymore on the chain. You would use sing single key signatures. So it, 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 there's a problem of people will actually change behavior if this was in, in a non-observable way. That's, so, so, yeah. Yeah, so there's kind of a meta thing when, when, um, about the way that Peter and Greg and I work where we often can come to agreement on the solution to these problems, but we almost never agree on what the problems themselves are. <laughs> and so we're all independently trying to fix our own hobby horse. And, uh, and depending which one of us gets the mic, uh, the talk comes out differently, unless there are two mics and all three of us in the room. Yeah. <laughs> all right, in fact, okay, Peter drew figure three. I will give him that. He had, he had every right to answer a question about figure three. Uh, about constant size uh, multisig. So, from practically speaking, what's the average or what's the median uh, amount of N for multisig on a blockchain? Because it sounds like even if worst case scenario, when you have five, like for example, you have a ten parties, and you like five out of ten, so uh, different like combinations like ten factorial divided by five factorial and square, it's only like seventeen bit uh, loss of information. So it's more than enough to still build. 
like practically secure for a Bitcoin size of key. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying. If you've got a, like a five or ten, if you're putting five signatures onto the blockchain, you have to pay the transaction fees. No, no, no. Like, right? I speak about constant size. Yeah. So the problem was like if you have a lot of artists, like uh, from combinatorical point of view, there are so many valid uh, possible uh, uh, valid um, signatures that up to some amount. So if n is sufficiently large, it would be possible to guess uh, the signature. So that's why how, the how big does K2N have to Oh, okay. The, the number of valid signatures does not depend on the number of parties. Right, so every possible signature, so there are roughly 2 to the 256 possible signatures, and every one of them individually could have been produced by every possible set. It's how it's like that. like that's kind of, so when I talk about not being accountable, I mean something like way stronger, which is like literally every possible signature could have come from every possible subset. Yeah, the, 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 the Lagrange multipliers will conspire to make that possible. The, the protocol is zero knowledge in the, in the technical sense, that every possible output could have been produced by every possible set of the question is about like trying to get the actual signature that hits the chain, but there's no, the signature doesn't reveal any information about that. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. question is, how, how, you were arguing that information theoretically, you were arguing information theoretically that we can't have constant size. And so the question is, let's explore that, let's explore that, right? How big does K choose N have? have to be before it exceeds like 2 to the 256 or 2 to the 512, so that uh, it must be the case that there are, there, there must oh, be the case yeah. that you can get a collision in the yeah. side, the, the, the number of co combinations. Unless you increase, well, it, it, the question is if you increase the size of the signature, so if you increase the size of the signature, None then, of this then, the then yes, but if you don't increase the size of the signature, the, the, there is no way to add any information unless you break the zero knowledge property of the signature. Which potentially you could do. Like I can probably, with five minutes, write down a scheme where you restrict the range of nonces, and then you can prove which which uh, set of signers signed. Um, but if you did that, then also the signature would be insecure in practice, not just in theory. So maybe there's a scheme that makes it that where it's not insecure, uh, you know, in practice. But you would either have to break zero knowledge or add data. That, that's my intuition, but I would like to cut off this like okay. armchair design session here because there are other people in the room. Uh, Oleg again. <laughs> uh, in, a different question. So uh, I heard opini opinions about committing the public key into the oh, knowledge yeah. hash, and I even heard something like the zero knowledge proof is when you commit the public key, and the signature protocol is when you don't. And so it sounds a little bit crazy, but some people were exploding in CDs say oh, that doesn't commit the public key to uh, kind of like tweak the signature post factum to be signature under a different public key. So what's the story about this? Like, is there a consensus of like what you should do, or whether this like non-committing public key is actually giving some kind of useful features in some sure. projects? So there's consensus amongst everybody who's standing behind the podium right here. Um, so. <laughs> So the, the distinction between a signature and a proof of knowledge, actually this is something that came up uh, before this talk, when people were talking about this. Um, so the security property of a signature is just that if you give an adversary a public key and as many signatures on whatever, whatever the adversary wants you to sign, can the adversary produce a signature on a new message? There's also something called a strong signature, where it's allowed to reuse one of the messages, but it has to somehow change the signature. Um, the property of a zero-knowledge proof of knowledge is much stronger. That is, given a signer and some sort of simulator for the signer that's like playing with the uh, random oracle and, uh, and forking it or doing other stuff, can you somehow actually extract a secret key? So conceptually, these, these are very different things. And in practice, it's kind of interesting that if you took this Schnorr signature that I've written right here, and I dropped the P from this, this hash E here, if I didn't commit to the public key in the signature, I would get a strong signature. It would satisfy that property that nobody could forge, um, forge a signature if I gave them a public key and a pile of signatures. But it would not be a proof of knowledge. And then by adding this commitment to P, I get a proof of knowledge. And the result in practice, the distinction in practice, is not just as academic like what a security property thing is, is that if you have a signature, 
If you have a Schnorr signature that does not commit to the public key and is not a proof of knowledge, it is possible to tweak a Schnorr signature, thereby changing the public key and change the message. So you can change the message to whatever you want. You will get a valid signature, but with a different public key. And the public key will be like the original public key plus some like weird, like something that kind of looks like a BIP32 tweak, but definitely is not. Um, it works with BIP32 as well. I think you guys are wrong. Um, <laughs> what do you mean it works with BIP32? Not, not a change in the message, but if you hold the message constant. Oh, yeah, you can, yeah, you okay, can yeah. if you take a Schnorr signature that does not commit to the public key and you know the chain code public key of the parents, you can turn it into a signature for any leaf in the same Oh, each yeah, of course. Yeah, I see that. So the, the, the thing, you see, you see the, the red X in the bottom of the equation, right? If you just add E times like whatever junk you want to that equation, you'll basically be adding that whatever junk to X. And so if you know a BIP32 path, you can, you can tweak E to it. Right, so you can get a signature with a parent key, and then from there get a signature from a child key. And so even from a child key, you can get other, ch ch um, other children. Um, so the question is, um, you know, this is maybe useful in some cases. Um, people talk about using this kind of like key recovery to do all sorts of weird crypto tricks where they will like come up with a signature and then later learn a message and then like somehow they'll have a public key corresponding to that message and the public key will kind of behave like what the signature should have been except it gets committed to a different part of the blockchain so you can do stuff in other orders and it's really cool and like why wouldn't you want the ability to do this? And the reason is because otherwise you can forge signatures by changing your BIP32 palette and stuff. And the result is just really foot gunny and dangerous. So my feeling is that we should always commit to the public key, even though it disables this kind of cool crypto protocol. And even some of them are pretty cool and, and pretty appealing, but it's so dangerous. Um, I have two more arguments. <laughs> All right, fine. So uh, one is that I believe the music security proof requires committing to the public key. Yes, that is true. <laughs> um, and another one is, uh, and this is something I picked up from a Twitter discussion between DJB and Gregory Neve, uh, which was quite interesting, is even though we have a security proof that reduces music uh, to discrete logarithm, so uh, you know, if you had something that could forge a music signature, uh, it could be used to produce um, a discrete logarithm break. And the same is true for Schnorr signatures in general. But if you commit to the public key, then you can actually reduce a the security of a multi-signature to an actual single signature security. Um, and that's an argument of, because the, this theoretical reduction to discrete logarithm has a, has a, um, a weakness factor built in. It, it doesn't actually give you the same uh, security level and this reduction if you have the public key does not so you, you you can actually with the public key you can state that the multi signature is as secure as the single signature construction and, and without it it's only there is like a constant factor difference in the security so theoretically it has better security from that perspective yeah yeah and there are a few other arguments I can think of but I think those are pretty thorough already